Luke chapter number 16. We'll begin reading in verse 19. We're going to look at this in a little different light this morning than in times gone by. In verse number 19, the Bible says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died. He was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jordan, why don't you take us to the throne of grace, my son? Yes. Mm. Yes. 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 Mm. Amen. Thank you, Jordan. In this passage, we find Jesus telling of an account of two men. Uh, they have two very different lifestyles, and uh, they have two very different endings. And before we get to the message or the introduction, I... Uh, I want you to notice that both these men died. The beggar died. The Bible says the angels carried him unto Abraham's bosom. The Bible says the rich man died and he went to hell. And I want to qualify this uh, so that you understand we, we're Bible believers. And the Bible said that Lazarus died and went to Abraham's bosom. If we would have read the rest of the chapter, you would find where the rich man could see Lazarus over there with Abraham, and there was a great gulf between them to where one couldn't pass to the other side, and the other side couldn't pass to that side. Now, nowhere in the Bible do you find the term purgatory. Nowhere in the Bible do you find uh, 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 that ter uh, term, but where those who have tried to correct the Bible and invent a place called purgatory, they'll take it from this thought right here, that Lazarus died, but he didn't go to heaven. He went to a place called Abraham's bosom. We find that Jesus calls this place paradise. When he's dying on the cross... Uh, the one thief that looked at him and said, When thou comest in the kingdom, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You say, What is this place right here? Well, you see, the Bible says, Jesus said, uh, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way anybody goes to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the shed blood of Calvary. And you see, uh, starting in Exodus chapter number 12, when God gave the Passover feast, uh, 
God showed them and He really uh, uh, emphasized what He'd already told Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden uh, that it takes blood uh, to atone for sin. And uh, starting in Exodus chapter 12, Israel had to offer up a lamb uh, 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 each year uh, uh, to push back their sins for another year. Uh, if everything was done according to the law of God, uh, God would stay His wrath uh, uh, because of their sin for a year. Uh, uh, but the writer of Hebrews tells us that the blood of goats uh, and the blood of calves, uh, uh, they could not atone for our sin. Uh, uh, but it took uh, 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 the precious, royal, redeeming blood of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to take away our sin. Uh, uh, all those Old Testament saints who died uh, couldn't go directly to heaven because their sins hadn't been paid for by Jesus yet. So their sins were pushed back. They were still living in and under the grace of God, but their sins hadn't been paid for. So they went to a place called paradise, or Abraham's bosom. But we find that when Jesus resurrected, he told Mary not to touch him, for he had not yet fully ascended unto his father. In Ephesians, we find that he led captivity captive. What happened? After Jesus died, shed his blood, he didn't lie to that thief. He said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Jesus went down to this place called Abraham's bosom uh, and he preached to every one of those Old Testament saints. Uh, every one of them believed on the Lord Jesus Christ like every believer uh, 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 since has believed on the Lord. Uh, and when Jesus uh, ascended back to heaven to take the blood sacrifice to put on the mercy seat in heaven, uh, he took all those Old Testament saints with him uh, and today they're in glory. Uh, what a blessing because their sins were paid for by the same blood it took to pay for our sins. There is no more place called Abraham's bosom. The Apostle Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus took away the sting of death when he tasted death for all men. Uh, uh, the Bible says, O death, uh, uh, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Uh, 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 aren't you glad that, hey, when you die as a Christian, you go to glory? Mm -mm. I don't have to go somewhere and have somebody pray me out of there. Uh, I have a, a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and I'm in him and he's in me. Hallelujah. There is no paradise or Abraham's bosom but there was when Jesus was telling his story mm -hmm. now that was nowhere in my notes but I got to preaching and there it is huh when I was reading that I got to thinking about well, people might be confused about Abraham's bosom what is that well now you know if you want further uh, 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 explanation or explanation explanation or expounding on Abraham's bosom get that message on what was rolled away with the stone and uh, that'll help you with all that, all right? But let me show you three things about this rich man. I want you to see, first of all, that this rich man was copious. Look at verse 19. He said, there was a certain rich man. Let me stop right here. Nowhere in here does, this, does Jesus call this a parable. I've heard a lot of people say, well, that's a parable or that's an analogy. No, Jesus said there was a certain rich man. Mm -hmm. He said, and which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. This man was copious. That means this man fared sumptuously every day. The Bible says that he uh, wore purple clothing. That don't mean anything to us. I mean, you can go down to Walmart, God help you, or uh, Target, God help you more or go to Lazarus or Dillard's or Macy's or somewhere, and you can buy any color clothing you want. But back in that day, in order to have a garment of purple, it was usually made of silk. And what they would do is there were certain worms that they would actually uh, uh, squeeze the very life out of those worms, and what would expel from them was something they would make dye out of, which would become purple. Now listen, to get a whole garment of purple, that took a lot of worms giving themselves for it. And it was a very uh, ex 
expedient process and it, and it took a, you know, a lot of time and effort and energy. So if you had something with purple, it cost a lot of coin. The Bible says he wore purple and fine linen. He didn't wear burlap, fine linen. And he fared sumptuously every day. What that means is he had a feast every day. A whole feast of food every day. Now again, we're talking about Bible days. You just couldn't hop in the car and go to Kroger's and get whatever you wanted. You had to grow your food. You had to have livestock to have a feast. And you had to have people to prepare your food and all those sort of things. And the average person, uh, they live very meagerly and they just got by with a little bit every day. But not this man. This man fared sumptuously every day. He was copious. I want you to see something else about this rich man. He was compassionate. Look with me in verse 20. The Bible says, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fed, fell from the rich man's table. You say, how in the world can you say this rich man was compassionate? He didn't run him off, did he? He let that beggar stay at his gate every day, so whoever he invited to his feast every day... Uh, uh, the beggar could ask for money or ask for some food uh, uh, and the beggar even just desired the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Uh, the rich man was compassionate because he didn't uh, call for the law to take the vagrant away. Uh, uh, he didn't get out, uh, go out there and, and kick him and say get off my curve, stay away from my gate uh, quit harassing my guest. Uh, no, not at all. He was a compassionate man. He's a copious man. But can I say this? He was a condemned man. The Bible said in verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. He was condemned. Can I say this? The Bible makes it clear he was tormented in verse 23. Verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. I've heard people make an ignorant statement saying things like, I'll die and go to hell and party with my friends. There is no partying going on in hell, friend. Uh, the Bible makes it clear that hell is a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. It is a place prepared to inflict punishment on supernatural beings. The soul of man was never ever to end up in hell, but when man chose to sin, man must choose to be saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ or he's going to die and go to hell. Mm, there's only two places in eternity. There's the abode of God and there's the lake of fire. And can I say, it, he was so tormented, he said, one drop of water will bring me relief and comfort. He's tormented. Can I say this? He's tortured in hell. Look at verse 25. The Bible says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. The torture of hell is the memory. He said, Son, remember. Every person that dies and goes to hell will remember every time they heard the name Jesus Christ. They'll remember every time they heard, uh, they watched a movie and heard the song Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. They'll remember every time they drove by a true church that was preaching the gospel. What? They'll remember every time somebody told them you need to get born again. Uh, they'll remember every time they were invited to church. They'll remember every, every, every opportunity they had to escape the torture that they now face. Can I say, that's a lot of our problem. We remember too. We remember what we once were, was, or we remember when we failed the grace of God, we remember when we stepped in a mud puddle, and, and we can't get over that. There are certain things, if you're honest, and you've lived any length of time, there are certain things in your life you wish you could go back there and undo. Can you imagine spending eternity in the lake of fire, being tormented, and tortured with the memory I didn't have to come here he's tormented 
he's tortured, but then he's traumatized. You'd think that the physical pain and anguish, the mental anguish of the memory, that would be all you could suffer in hell. No, he's traumatized. Look with me down in verse number 27. The Bible says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that, they may, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. He's traumatized knowing that he's got five brothers going to end up there too. Isn't it amazing that man in hell has more of a burden for souls than most people sitting in Baptist churches today? He's traumatized, Brother Phil, thinking that he's got five brothers going to end up where he's at. Of course, Abraham says he can't send Lazarus from the grave. He said he's got Moses. They got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said because if they don't hear the word of God, they won't, they won't believe the one raised from the grave. Because Jesus did raise from the grave. And faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This is what I want to preach on this morning on this copious, compassionate, condemned man. I'm going to preach on, why did the rich man go to hell? Why did the rich man go to hell? And they say, preacher, what does this have to do with me? I'm not rich. Well, compared to most of the world, you are rich. Did you see that video? Did you see some of them houses and gypsies are living in in Romania? You're rich, friend, trust me. Huh? Some of you have uh, 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 nicer things on your back right now than the rest of the world will have in all their lifetime. Right. You are rich. Mm, but can I say, mm, being rich, it sent him to hell. One of the richest men in the Bible was Job. Job did not even go to hell. Job was down there in paradise waiting for Jesus to come preach. Hmm? So why did the rich man die and go to hell? Well, let me say, first of all, because he chose to trust in the wrong things. There's only one sin that will send you to hell. I know everybody's got a list of sins that will send you to hell. See, we categorize sin, but God don't. There's no big sin, little sin with God. There's just sin. He can't accept any of it. But there's only one sin that will send you to hell. It's the sin of unbelief. He chose to believe in something other than Jesus Christ. That's why he went to hell. It may have been his riches. He may have said, boy, these riches are going to get me to heaven. Found out that didn't work. Hmm? May have been because uh, 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 he chose to believe the philosophy he was a good man. I mean, uh, uh, he obviously didn't kick Lazarus away. He was a good man. That would get me into heaven. The Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. You see, when we compare ourselves to somebody else, we might think we're good. But when we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ, we're all heathens. You don't have enough goodness to get to heaven. If so, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. You don't have enough riches to pay to get to heaven uh, uh, because uh, money don't buy your way to heaven. It took the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to pay your sin debt. He chose to trust in the wrong things. And that's why he went to hell. I thought about this. Why did a rich man go to hell? Because he counted on having more time. Maybe somewhere along the line he had all intentions to get right with God before he died. He just didn't know he was going to die the day he died. One of the lies of the devil that has sent a lot of people to hell is he'll tell people in a service like this, when God starts dealing with somebody's heart about getting born again, the devil will say, well, you've got plenty of time. Mm -mm. I want to help you with something. Everybody in hell today believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're not getting out of hell. They're going to spend eternity paying for their own sins because they wouldn't let Jesus pay for their sin. Friend, I'd like to tell you you've got plenty of time. But I can't. I can't assure anybody that we've even got tomorrow. 
There will be a lot of people slip out into eternity today. And you may be one of them. Say, well, I'm healthy. Yeah, but that might not stop somebody from running a red light and T-boning you. Hmm? I don't know if you heard about this. Yesterday in Burlington, Kentucky. Anybody know where that's at? Four men broke into a house, pistol whipped a 21-year-old boy. Why, mom and a nine-year-old sibling will sit there and watch them and robbed the house and took two cars out of the driveway. It's only by the grace of God the boy that got pistol whipped lived. They just watching TV in Burlington, Kentucky. And somebody walked in the garage door and it was on. Friend, you don't know what a day brings forth. You know, I really didn't think about much about why is there COVID to hate and life at the house. Come back Wednesday night until Melissa says something on the way out. She was tore up and was glad that we was here. And she says, we're so glad you're back. And then it dawned on me, what if I would have died of that thing? What would have happened to the church? Hmm? We don't know what a day brings forth. Friend, you don't know if you've got next week. And Jesus could come back for his church before this service is even over. He just counted on he had more time. Most people do. Till time's gone. Preach a message one time on you won't miss the water till the well runs dry. We all think we got plenty of time. Mm -mm. But all we know is that today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You just got today, friend. I promise you, if we could roll back the crust of the earth and you could look into the very bowels of hell right now, and if you could holler down there to that rich man who's still there and say, hey, we'll give you another opportunity. You want to get born again? He would get born again. But you know what he would tell you? Don't put it off. And I say this, why did the rich man die and go to hell? And I say thirdly, it might have been because he had a contemporary view of Jesus. He might have believed in the Jesus that uh, is being promoted today, that Jesus just loves everybody and Jesus isn't going to put anybody into hell. Well, Jesus does love everybody, for the Bible says, for God is love. Jesus loved you so much he died a death that you should have died. He paid a debt that you couldn't pay. He shed his blood for you. He would die according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures uh, uh, with salvation in his wings. Uh, and friend, he said, whosoever will may come uh, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved today. He loved you that much. So he didn't even know me. Oh yeah, he did. And he's loved you with an everlasting love. He don't want you to die and go to hell. Why do you think he gave me this message? But there's a lot of people who believe, well, God is love. And God wears a peace sign. And God's never going to do anything bad to anybody. And God's never, ever going to send anybody to hell. Well, i got news for you. And God is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. And he's angry with the wicked every day. And God doesn't send anybody to hell. You're already in hell, friend. You don't even know it. You're just waiting to take your last breath and die and go to hell. That's what you deserve is hell. But Jesus died for you so you wouldn't have to go to hell. God doesn't send you to hell. Your sin sends you to hell. They got this contemporary view of Jesus that, you know, He's going to give you a second chance after you die and all kinds of falseness that is not from the Word of God. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Mm -mm. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, you don't have to die and go to hell. Jesus gave you an eternal gift of salvation. It's yours for the taking. You've just got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Why did the rich man go to hell? He might have been convinced his works could save him. There are people that have the mindset, well, I've, I've been a good person. I go to church. I give money to missions. I, I help the poor. 
I work at a soup kitchen. I'm good to my neighbors. I volunteer at the nursing home. And can I say, all those things are wonderful things. And thank you if you do those things. Because you're impacting somebody else's life. That's a blessing. But none of that will get you to heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Uh, 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 it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Your works can't get you to heaven, friend. The only work that could get you to heaven is the work of Calvary. Rich man thought, man, look at all the money I gave to the poor. Look at all the crumbs I gave that beggar out there at the gate. That's going to get me to heaven. See, there are people that have the mindset, Brother Bob. It's amazing how people take a, a little portion of Scripture and twist it. Just like Abraham's bosom. But then there are people who will take that uh, portion out of Daniel where the handwriting on the wall says thou were weighed in the balances and found wanting and there are people that have the mindset brother Ted that when they die God's going to take all their good works and weigh it on one side of the scale and all their bad deeds on the other side if their good outweighs their bad they get to go to heaven it's not biblical no see if you wait till you die you, you're dead you're in trouble See, where you spend eternity is based on what you do in this life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And can I say this? That it's not about you. It's about what He did for you. Amen. And what you've done with Him. Right. But people are so confused. It amazes me how people will swallow camels and strain at gnats and die and go to hell. Believing a little partial truth. By the way, when the devil deceived Eve, he just twisted the scriptures a little bit. And there's a lot of people putting their fate of eternity on a twisted little bit. You better believe on the Lord. He, he, he thought he was convinced his works would get him there. And then I thought about this lastly. Why did he go to hell? The rich man went to hell because they had a compromised Christian at his gate. Let me say that again. The rich man went to hell because he had a compromised Christian at his gate. Did not Lazarus go to Abraham's bosom and is in heaven today? So could we say that Lazarus was a saved man, that he knew God? What's he doing begging at the rich man's gate? He should have been showing that rich man what it takes to be saved. But he's not doing that. Can I say that Lazarus didn't warn the rich man. No, he, he prayed on the generosity of the rich man and stayed at his gate. But not one time do we see where he warned the rich man. Those riches won't take you to heaven. That contemporary view of the Messiah won't take you to heaven. Your good works won't take you to heaven. Not one time did he warn him. The Bible says in Colossians 1.28, speaking of Jesus, whom we preach, uh, warning every man uh, and touching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul warned every man. Lazarus didn't. He didn't warn him. Can I say secondly, Lazarus didn't walk upright before him. Did not David say this in Psalms 37.25? I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaking, nor his seed begging bread. Did we just not establish Lazarus was a saved man? Why is he begging out at the rich man's gate? Did not, is the Bible true? 
Did David say he not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread? Then what's Lazarus being a bum for? Why ain't he at the temple asking God, God supply my needs? Because he's compromised. He's a hypocrite. He's wanting the rich man to take care of him, but he don't care about the rich man's soul. He's not walking upright before the rich man. How many of your co-workers are going to die and go to hell because you walk around this world like you're, uh, 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 God's terrible and, and God's not good to you and you moan and you cry and you belly ache. Uh, 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 you don't have the joy of Jesus glowing from you. Uh, uh, you aren't telling them how good God's been, how good God was at the house of God Sunday, uh, how good God was in your prayer meeting, how good God was when you was reading about Him. Uh, uh, you don't talk about the blessings of God in your life. Uh, you don't tell them you ought to be in hell, but one day Jesus walked by. No, all you do is complain about uh, 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 the election and all you do is whine uh, about how rough you've got it and how tough you've got it uh, and people are tripping and dying and going to hell over your life. The Bible calls believers a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. We're not of the rudiments of this world. Why was Lazarus begging at his gates? Because he was living beneath his privilege as a Christian. Just like some of you. Hmm? He didn't walk up right before him. Let me show you something. The Bible said in verse 20, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, I know we got Naysayer and Nelly out there. Well, God was so good, He sent the dogs by to lick His sores. I also have heard other people say, well, the beggar got to go to heaven because he lived a terrible life here, and the rich man lived a good life here, so he died and went to hell. Hogwash. Somewhere along the line, that beggar put his faith in the Lord. And somewhere along that line, the rich man didn't. Has nothing to do with their economic status. God is no respecter of persons. It don't matter what side of the tracks you live on. Uh, doesn't matter what color your skin is. Uh, doesn't matter anything about you. What matters is what you do with Him and if you'll put your faith in Him. But I want you to see something about this beggar who's a sorry, no good Christian. Hmm? Said he laid at his gate full of sores and a desire to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now look here. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. You see that, don't you? Now, there literally were dogs that come and licked his putrefying sores, and I don't want to get real gross right there. But I want you to see what this is a picture of, Brother Brian. Those dogs are a picture of false preachers. Does not Paul call them dogs? Those of the circumcision, dogs preaching false gospel and false doctrine? Lazarus is listening to the false doctrine, the false preachers, uh, and that's why he's not much of a Christian. You go ahead and read your Joyce Myers, and go ahead and read your, your smiley face uh, 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 Joe Wolstein, and just watch that grieve the Spirit of God out of your life. Get you some good godly material and read that and get in the Bible and read that and spend time with Jesus and let God show you something that helps your soul, not grieves your soul. He didn't warn him. He didn't walk up right before him. And he didn't win him. Paul said over there in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If you're here today and you've never been born again, I didn't ask you if you was a member of the church. I didn't ask you if you've been baptized. I didn't ask you if you gave money to the poor. If you've never been born again, if I could get saved for you, I would. If there was anything physically I could do for you, I would. So you'd get, you'd get born again. You don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want you to die and go to hell. This church don't want you to die and go to hell. Uh, uh, the believers in this place today don't want you to die and go to hell. It's not worth it, friend. 
And if there's anything I could do to persuade you, I'd do whatever I could so you wouldn't die and go to hell. Some of you right now are trying to persuade yourself you're saved. You're trying to convince yourself in your mind. You're trying to justify your salvation. You're right now trying to talk yourself into an experience you had. Here's your barometer. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you've got to try and act like you're saved, you're not saved. If you've been born again, the Spirit of God took up residence in your life and He changed your life. I say it all the time. I drink all the booze I want to drink. I do all the dope I want to do. I do all the carousing around I want to do. I do all that I want to do. The problem is I just don't want to do any of that. Because when Jesus saved me, He changed my desires. Why do you go to church? Do you have to? No, I long to. Yeah. Two weeks being at church was killing me. I want to tell you something. Uh, 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 I appreciate the live stream. And I appreciate the good preaching we got to hear. Good singing we got to hear. Uh, I enjoyed it, uh, uh, watching and listening. But my spirit was grieved because uh, I wanted to be here. Uh, I wanted to be amongst God's people uh, and feel the presence of God. Why? Because uh, He changed me when He saved me. Uh, I want to be where the Lord hangs out. Uh, I want to read about him. I want to sing about him. I want to be around his people. There's just something about being saved. Hallelujah. Huh? So preacher, if I get born again, why act like you? You might act worse. You might act like Phil. I don't know. Being saved is not in how somebody acts. There's a lot of actors out there. Being saved is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and repenting of your sins. Has there ever been a time when the Holy Spirit revealed to you you was lost? You weren't saved. And under that, we term it conviction. When you realize you wasn't saved, you called on the Lord and asked Him to save you. Friend, if not, today would be a wonderful day for you to get born again. Say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. A minute, we're going to give an invitation. You come. We'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved today. You say, what will all these people think? Well, first of all, if you're concerned enough about your soul, you won't care what all these people The night I got saved, there could have been 10,000 people there. I wouldn't have cared. I needed to get to Jesus. Uh, but I want to tell you what this crowd will think. This crowd loves you. Say, they don't even know me. No, but they know the Lord, and the Lord loves you. And they love you. They don't want you to die and go to hell. This crowd right here, you'll find they'll be there for you. They won't turn their back on you. This crowd right here, they'll pray for you when you need prayer. This crowd right here, if you, if you get to run a little short, this crowd right here reach in their pocket and they'll help you out. I, I, I've seen it happen. This crowd right here, they're for you, not against you. You don't have an enemy in this crowd right here. Mm -mm. You say, preacher, I'm just so afraid. I know it's a big step. But I promise you the invitation, if you take the first one, Jesus helps you take the rest. And let me ask you this. Say, say, preacher, I know I'm saved. You can go right back right now to the night you got saved. You know when Jesus moved into your heart and life. You can go back to that place. I know I'm saved, preacher. Well, are you a real Christian? Or are you a Lazarus Christian? He was sorry. Are you trying to walk right before people are you trying to win people or you don't really care it's all about you there's a lot of people in that boat a lot of people don't care about missionaries a lot of churches don't care about missionaries why are we taking on so many missionaries because there's so many lost people preacher why are we going to build I remember when we was in the old building, people got mad because we was going to build this building. I did. They got mad. Well, I, I want to keep our little church. We'll go somewhere else. We, we want to be a Bible church. Why are we going to build? Because there's a lot of lost people. You got to make room for them. Amen. By the way, you, it's time to build when you're at 75% capacity on Sunday morning. We're over that now. And we got a lot of folks out today. Time to build. Why? Because Jesus hadn't come yet. 
So, well, what happens if we're in the middle of the building and Jesus comes? Well, the Antichrist can have it. I don't care, huh? We're just going to keep walking by faith until he comes. Huh? But I'm interested in your soul today. And if you're here and you're not sure if you're saved, don't end up like this rich man in hell. If you die and go to hell, you'll remember this message. You'll see my ugly face in your mind forever thinking, why didn't I listen to that man? Why didn't I give my heart to Jesus? Why didn't I make sure? If you're not sure, we give this invitation. Why don't you come and get sure? Uh, if you're here today and you claim to be saved, but your life is nothing but a lie. The only time you act like you're saved is when you're in church. You need to get born again. You're here today and you're saved, but you never ever really consider about other people dying and going to hell. You need to get in the altar and say, God, break my heart for sinners. It ought to break our hearts even hearing about that rich man in hell. God, help us to do what we can to have compassion on some pulling them from the, from the fire. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. There are people dying and going to hell. What are we doing about it? See, that's the only thing that really matters. Why have a church if you don't care about winning souls? God, help us to try and be a light and be good to people so we can get them to Jesus. Let's all stand. Mr. Renee, just come to the piano and play something sweet and slow. While she's coming to the piano, let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. We're thankful you first loved us. And Lord, I don't know how many times I've preached out of that text through the years, but reading it this time and seeing that that beggar shouldn't have been begging broke my heart. Lord, how many of us live so selfishly instead of seeing the needs of those around us dying and going to hell? So God, break our hearts for righteousness' sake. Give us a burden for souls. Now, Father, I pray for those in our attendance today that may be trusting in a church membership certificate or a baptismal certificate or trusting in their deeds. Lord, I pray the sweet Holy Ghost of God right now would open their eyes to their lost condition. And Lord, through cords of love, I pray you would draw them to an altar of repentance. Help them to take that first step. And then, Lord, help them to take the rest and help them to give their life to Jesus today. Those that are living lies, help them to see it. Those that are lost, help them to see it. And those that are lousy, help them to see that too. God, work in this invitation, change lives. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.